Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program. I'm Kate Seeley, Senior Vice President of the Middle East Institute, and I want to thank you for joining us for the uh, film screening of uh, Sahbek, Sahbek uh, your friend in Arabic, uh, to be followed by a discussion about the film among three highly seasoned professionals. They'll be sharing their views about the broader implications of a story about love and friendship among communities who have for too long been in conflict. But before I introduce the film, just a few housekeeping matters. Um, if you could please turn off your phones. Uh, and if you are going to tweet tonight about the conversation, um, please tweet using the hashtag MEI Arts Culture. It is our arts Twitter handle, and it is also an, an amazing resource about uh, daily cultural happenings in the Middle East, so please do follow it. And if you're not aware, MEI's annual banquet and conference are coming up November 14th and 15th at the Capitol Hilton. Uh, our banquet is going to be emceed by the famous Egyptian-American comedian Ahmed Ahmed of the um, Axis of Evil tour fame. And we'll be honoring two uh, superstars from the region, Fadi Randour, a uh, Lebanese Jordanian who founded one of the region's most successful businesses, uh, Aramex, is sort of the FedEx of the Arab world. And then he left it to pour his passion into supporting social entrepreneurship around the region. And he has, I think, single-handedly done more than anyone else in the Middle East to give Arab youth the support and the resources they need to um, follow their entrepreneurial dreams. And we're also honoring Sheikha Hossa al Sabah of Kuwait, uh, who runs a cultural center and a museum which houses the um, world's largest private collection of Islamic art. And she works hard to educate communities around the world about the wealth of Islamic art and culture. And then the next day, we're hosting an all day policy conference that will be capped by a panel examining uh, women's activism in the Arab world. And it'll be featuring top Arab women activists, including a Saudi woman, uh, Fauzia Bakr, who has spent decades advocating for women to drive. So uh, we'll get to share with her um, her celebration of the um, latest uh, development in Saudi Arabia, allowing women to drive. Um, so a little bit about uh, the film. I think I uh, have lost my page. But anyway, um, a little bit about the film and uh, the filmmaker. Um, Priyali Soor. Um, she directed it. And it is a, is a film that captures the unlikely love and friendship between Muslim uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinian Muslims. And in the process, it helps to humanize the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and to shed light on the wonderful complexities of human uh, engagements in a way that only the arts can do. Now, Priyali is going to tell you tonight what motivated her to make this film, so I'm not going to say much about it. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Priyali. She has a background in human rights and gender issues uh, and covered many stories related to gender and conflict um, as a journalist with CNN India for a decade for which she won numerous uh, national journalism awards. Uh, she's currently based in Washington and works as a social development consultant at the World Bank, where she's led several multimedia development communications projects. Now, she'll be joined by MEI's Rhonda Slim, a conflict resolution expert. Uh, Rhonda is the director of our Track Two Dialogues and is a non-resident fellow at the Johns Hopkins, um, at John Hopkins SICE. Uh, she's the former vice president of the International Institute for S Sustained Dialogue and has been a senior program officer or a advisor at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, a guest scholar at USIP, and a program director at Resolve, Inc., among uh, many of her other accomplishments. And Rhonda and Priyali will be in conversation with Margaret Warner, the chief foreign affairs correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. Uh, Margaret reports on and analyzes US foreign policy and developments at home and abroad. She founded the NewsHour's overseas reporting unit and began producing in-depth reports from areas in crisis, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, Israel, Gaza, the West Bank, Syria, Lebanon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. And her reporting spans politics and military conflicts, as well as the plight of women and refugee issues. And she's received many awards, including an Emmy Award in 2007 for her reporting on Pakistan. Now, can we just put the three of you uh, in charge of solving the world's conflicts? I think the world would be a much better place. Uh, what a, an amazing concentration of brilliance we have here tonight. So thank you, ladies, for joining us. Thank you for sharing your, your expertise, your insights, um, and your dedication to um, the cause of peace. 
uh, and also your dedication to tonight's conversation. So the way the evening is going to run, uh, Priyali is going to come up and say a few words about the film, then we're going to watch Sahbek, and then our guests will join us on stage for a conversation, and we'll take your questions, and we'll wrap it around 7. So thank you, and please, Priyali, over to you. I just want to say a few uh, quick thank yous. Thank you to everybody who's here uh, today. I want to thank uh, the Middle East Institute, um, uh, Lynn Snage, Kate Seeley, Wendy Chamberlain for helping me organize the screening here, uh, to Randa Slim and Margaret Warner who've been such huge support. I couldn't have done this without you, so thank you. Uh, last year, exactly around this time, um, uh, me and my friend Ben Carver, who's here, we were filming uh, in Israel and West Bank. Um, I wanted to tell a story about people, uh, about people who've been maneuvering their lives on a day-to-day -day basis around a conflict which has been more than seven decades almost. I wanted to tell a story about uh, the emotion of love, um, the simple joy of friendship, and how such simple and beautiful things can be so difficult and complicated in a region which is scarred by conflict and war. Um, how everyday things we do, like deciding to see a friend, or falling in love, or deciding to marry, how these things become decisions which are influenced by politics in certain regions. Uh, what we did find before Beautiful Stories um, these, are, these are stories of real people. These people are uh, atypical. They're outliers. Um, they do not conform to the status quo. They ask questions. And yet, as you will notice in the film, there is a certain amount of fear where they are scared to come out and talk very openly. So there's a couple in the film who are married, but they don't want to reveal their identity, so we had to film it sensitively. Um, I hope you enjoy the film, and we'll uh, follow it up with the discussion, and I'll take your questions. Such a great group here. Priyali, I've seen this film, this is the third or fourth time, and it's, I find it incredibly moving every time, really. Um, the three of us who know one another uh, talked about what we'd talk about, but I'm going to start with a totally different question than we talked about, which is how did you, I mean, these are all real people uh -huh. who are living in a vulnerable state and they showed their emotions to you. Uh, how did you persuade them to talk to you and to let you film them? And why do you think they did? So it was difficult uh, with some people. So for the married couple, it was very difficult to get them on the film. Uh, initially, they said, no, uh, we are scared. We are trying to get his passport. We had threats before you know, we could get married. People were calling them on their phones and saying that there could be violence, we could stop the marriage, and things like that. So they were really scared. And then we said that we'll probably try and film it in a way where we do not reveal your identity, so that. Um, in terms of the father and the brother, uh, father whose daughter died 19 years ago then, 20 today, um, he was initially hesitant, and then he said, I haven't thought about meeting the family of the bomber for 20, 19 years, but maybe it's time now that we did it. But we went through a lot of up and down. Every other day he would say, I can, I can't, I can, I can't. And ultimately they decided that for the security of the Palestinian family, they said that they did not want to because if an Israeli family goes and meets them in Palestine, at, in Nablus, they felt that they would be ostracized from the rest of the Palestinian community is what he told us. So that letter that appears, that computer, you know, that's been sent by email, yes. that was to you? That email was to me saying that I'm sorry, from but the we- From the father. From the father saying, I'm sorry, but we've decided not to meet the family, so yeah. And that's mm -hmm. why, and then you went to Nablus. Then we went to Nablus because we wanted to meet the family and see if they had a message like if there was animosity, what, what was the feeling there? And they were like, we would welcome them uh, because we yes. realized that this is not about personal enmity, it's about something which is about the policies of that region. So, so. Rhonda, does it surprise you that, that these 
couples, families were, were willing to let Priyali into their lives? Uh, I mean, do you think they're unusual, the very, very unusual, very atypical? Or do you think there's a lot of yearning still, despite the wall, despite the violence, for some connection? I think at the human level, and I've seen it in many conflicts, uh, in many other societies that are going through conflict, I think everybody at the human level feels that they are victims. Now, and in that, approach, then they feel affinity to the other side, despite all the injustices, the conflict, the fighting, the killing. But there is this common identity of being a victim mm -hmm. of forces that are outside their control. And so I have to say that definitely these people have shown a certain level of moral courage, but also physical courage. But I've seen it also in many other conflict settings, uh, you know, I do track too, and uh, when you try, especially in active conflict situation, when you try to bring people in dialogue with each other, um, people they have identified in the past as enemies, it requires a special kind of people who have made this transition in their own minds, that dialogue, reaching out to the other side, is a way to solve this conflict. The problem is that usually in these conflicts, there are not enough of them to create a critical mass. And the few that engage in these acts of courage, of defining the boundaries, of going against you know, the normal uh, in that setting, like the couple, the anonymous couple, they remain anonymous because of threats, but also in the end, as your movie shows, they decide they cannot live in that place. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem, is that we have, I mean, human beings can go far as change agents, but in this case, we are talking about now 50 years of occupation. It has created that kind of bureaucracy, they said, uh, the kind of walls and, and, and obstacles that Personally, as somebody who hails from the Middle East, I'm almost, you know, uh, how to say, I don't think that there would be a solution there, at least in my lifetime. And I've grown up with this conflict. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it has now, you know, created this infrastructure that both uh, 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 both in terms of laws, in terms of bureaucracies, but also infrastructure in terms of narratives mm -hmm. that is going to be hard to break through. You see movements, and there are, in my opinion, always opportunities for people to come together and try to you know, uh, create new alliances. And I think there are now attempts at creating new strategic alliances involving Palestinians, Israelis, Jewish diaspora, which are different mm -hmm. and which can hopefully, you know, create more opportunities. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are at a stage after 50 years of occupation where I think many people, even in this country, feel that final status kind of agreement or final agreement seems to be um, Further, getting further and further from being realized. Do you think it's also further and further in the minds of people? There's a kind of a hope, ho oh sorry, a hopelessness that I thought, come, even among these eight brave people, uh, I think back, I mean, the first time I went to the Middle East, I used to go, this was right after the Gulf War, and George H.W. Bush was president, and Jim Baker was Secretary of State, and there was this, great hope and expectation that something would happen, something would come together. And this is even before Oslo. Um, and then each time I go back, and of course, as the, is it the daughter of Ruth, Diane? Right, yeah. You know, she expresses the, well, you know, 
The security situation's terrible. There's stabbings every morning, even despite the wall. And I, I began to notice that even among Israelis who you would not consider, you know, on the right or Likudniks or whatever, however you want to describe the spectrum, that there was, you know, people sitting in a mall would say, well, I hated the idea of the wall, but I'm relieved. I'm relieved my child can go to the disco in Tel Aviv on, you know, Thursday night. Do you, you're so young, you probably don't know if it's worse, but you, I mean, would you say that the people have become a lot more distant I from think one another? It has become normal. That's yes. my fear. It has been normalized. Now it's become part of an accepted status quo. And, and, and I don't see how you are going to break this. Uh, in my work, for example, uh, in the Arab region, this conflict is not the first one that people talk about when you are meeting with officials. Or, there are so many conflicts in the region. I mean, the, 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 let's say the, there are so many refugees. We used to have Palestinian refugees. Now you have Syrian refugees. You have Iraqi refugees. You have, you know, uh, you, we used to have pictures of, you know, on, 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 on our skins of Palestinian kids, of Israelis, you know, uh, throwing stones, uh, kids being, uh, being uh, for throwing stones stopped by Israeli army. Now we are seeing, you know, Assad's planes killing children in Syria. There is somehow, people are exhausted from the war. And, and so the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has become somehow normal. It doesn't, even if you look at Arab TV, you know, uh, I don't know how much of that space is now being devoted to this conflict. It's more about, you know, Syria, it's more about Iraq, it's about Libya, it's about Yemen. Yeah. Right. And that's I, the fear. I, I just wanted, uh, you know, we had this conversation before, yes. so I want to just bring you back to a point. And I'm going to use the four words that Trump tweeted, calm before the storm. So. <laughs> Do you think this could be a calm before the storm? Because I remember you said something like, this, is, this status quo is not going to be like this forever. It's, it's just, it will change because there's so much anger simmering. Correct, correct. The problem is that, you're right, this status quo, the way that is now, is, is, is not sustainable for the long term. Uh, but at the same time, hope for uh, peace or for uh, outside intervention, especially from this, ad from this administration, um, to change the status quo, at least through political means. Uh, uh, I'm not very hopeful about it. I know there is an attempt right now to do a, a another, go, to take another, to do another go at a peace uh, at peace negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But now it's being linked as part of this initiative to roll back Iranian influence. And mm -hmm. so it is creating an alliance of Arab states uh, that can work with you know, Israel to put together a front against uh, Iran. And so we are, again, not focusing enough but trying to link any approach to solving this conflict to this other conflict, which is the Saudi-Iranian conflict, which in my opinion divert attention and resources uh, away from uh, what needs to be devoted to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But again, uh, you're right. I think there will be another intifada down the line. Uh, you cannot keep people oppressed, repressed, uh, uh, no hopes for jobs, no hopes for no opportunities without another intifada. Uh, the problem is that uh, you have divisions. I mean, you have on one hand a, an Israeli leadership that is, doesn't seem to be wanting to make the necessary concession to move even one step further towards peace. You have also on the Palestinian side a division, which supposedly Egypt now is trying to heal, that also has prevented the Palestinian from taking a strong stand and uh, the initiative. Because concessions, to move us to the next steps, 
concessions need to be made by both sides. And there are going to be tough concessions. And I'm afraid that on both sides, on the Israeli side, on the Palestinian side, you don't have the kind of political leadership that is ready to make the concession that will have political costs. Don't you think, though, that you also have to have two populations that Correct. have been, who do want change and believe it's possible. Yeah. And, and also, of course, the political leadership has been talking about the prospects, which of course they have not on either side. Did you find anyone, I mean, I was struck by the resignation, say in your opening scene with the young men playing the drums, and they, you know, should I bring my, he didn't call her my girlfriend, but come to visit. And there wasn't any anger from any of them. It was just, well, I think that would be bad, that would be bad for, you know, dangerous for her, dangerous for us. But I mean, was that typical of what you found? <coughs> that, that as Rhonda says, it's just the normal now. The, the fact that they, did, they suggested not to bring the girl to East Jerusalem, that was one. The second thing was that none of the others had friends who were Israelis. Mm -hmm. um, thirdly, um, I think what uh, people in Palestine and West Bank, what, where, where I visited, they mostly like the family of the bomber, right? So when we went there, what they were talking about is access to hospitals. Mm -hmm. They have to be at checkpoints for hours before they can have access to hospitals. Children are stuck before they can go to school. So he, because he's not allowed to go to Israel, his wife uh, went to have her child in a hospital in Israel, but he was not allowed to go visit his wife and child and see the birthing of the child. So that was so much of anger, and up, he was super, very upset about that. So these are the issues. This is the father of the bomber. This, no, the father of the, this is the, the, nephew, of the nephew of the bomber. Ah, the, the nephew, nephew of, of the, the bomber. bomber. He said that we are not going to be allowed on the other Sorry, side forever. That's right. So he said, I, I, I couldn't go to meet my wife when she was having a child. Now, did he, he tried to go and jump the wall, whether he was successful in that or no. Or did he take a risk to do that? That's a different story, so. You know, Margaret, I think what you registered also is a, is a common human response to a protracted conflict. You know, you try and you try yeah. and then eventually you just give up, you get tired, you get exhausted, mm -hmm. and you try to create a certain element or a minimum modicum of normalcy in the space where you live in order to carry on with your life. And I see it also in other you know, areas of ongoing conflict, is either you do that and you accept, you know, and you try to do small changes here and there, but you are fighting against major structural systemic you know, challenges and you feel often alone, you know? And, and, and either you do that or you leave, like the anonymous couple who decided, mm -hmm. we tried, but the bureaucracy won, yeah. and we are going to leave. We cannot live here together. Or, or you know, you give up on living, mm -hmm. and you go and, you know, become a suicide bomber, or, you know, you go and do a violent act, you know, against uh, against 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 uh, Palestinian. You just give up on life. So this is, in my opinion, one of three modes that people in protracted conflicts lie, which with which which offer no no prospects of solution mm -hmm. in the short to medium term. Uh, you know, engage in or opt for, and it differs from one person to another. Uh, but that's, that's the situation. Well, we're going to go to questions from the audience. And here's someone raising his hand right now. And um, I'll just encourage, you know, not to make a speech, but have a question. But I'm intrigued at the prospect of people like this meeting perhaps in a, in a fairly isolated conference setting, a few hundred of these folks, and asking them, without outside interference, to craft a roadmap uh, of their own. And so I'm wondering how you track down such people, because if you were to have such a conference, you'd have to do that several hundred times. How did you find people with strong links to the other side of the fence? Very good oh. question. As in how did I find the people in the film? Well, these, these, all these people. I mean, who, who are part of the film? Um, 
I started contacting a lot of journalists on the field there. So um, I had some people who had written books about that region, so I contacted them. I spoke to a lot of local journalists who connected me with a lot of nonprofit organizations which are working um, in trying to bring more connections between people on the either side. And we tried um, maybe 15, 20 people, and then we came down to four stories. Yeah. But there's a lot less interaction, isn't there? Than there used than to before. be. Exactly. I mean, That's professors used to go back yes, and forth, yes, and there would be conferences, yes, and now yes. they're you know, difficult. There has been a lot of, of attempts at bringing Palestinian and Israelis over the years. I mean, forever yeah. now. And, and yeah. there has been a lot of research on what we call contact theories and their yeah. impact on the structural causes of conflict. And so people are reevaluating all of that as well. So it's right here, sir. And if you would I'm like curious, to introduce uh, yourself. The uh, attitude of other Arab states uh, regarding the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And also the impact you think those very large numbers of Palestinians living outside of mm. Palestine. Now we have generations mm. of refugees mm. and how their attitudes towards this is going to um, influence the final outcome. It seems to me that if this hatred continues mm. to multiply over generations, mm that the outcome is inevitable. Mm. Being? The outcome is inevitable, the exactly. The outcome, what is inevitable? What's inevitable? Oh, sorry. Well, well from my background, you don't give up. Mm. And if you've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who feel the way some of the uh, is, uh, the Palestinians did in this film, and you've got a shrinking Israeli population, yes. it seems to me that it's obvious that in the course of time, uh, this is going to explode. In terms of the Arab states, um, I think there is now a good opportunities um, uh, for Arab states like Saudi Arabia, like UAE, to go beyond the terms of the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002 in trying to reach some kind of normalized relationship with Israel in return for Israeli concession on settlement activities. I don't think that there is any, how to say, hope not say hope, but there is no expectation that we're going to have a final agreement reached, but that there is an interim kind of agreements could be struck, uh, primarily because of this feeling that is prevalent, especially in many Gulf countries, that Israel is a more existential threat to them, uh, sorry, that Iran is more of an existential threat to them than Israel. And the Trump administration has been, again, trying to push this idea of creating this alliance between Arab states and, uh, and Israel in a front against Iran in order to contain Iran's destabilizing behavior in the region. So, however, I'm afraid that again, the Israeli leadership is going to miss this opportunity because it's a serious opportunity from the Arab states. Uh, and it is an opportunity partly because also, I don't think Arab states could do this 10 years ago because the Arab publics would not be ready for it. Partly because the Arab publics are ready for it, not because they have changed their attitude about Israel in terms of Arab publics, but because they just, this conflict is not as of a priority to them as it used to be. So you are not going to have the kind of pushback from Arab public to this overture if Israel were to accept it from the Arab governments with the mediation of the Americans. My fear is that the Israelis are going to miss this opportunities, especially this particular Israeli leadership, thinking that if they wait longer, 
they can get more concessions from the Arabs. The only thing is that the first person I remember hearing about this idea that Israel had new allies in the essentially the Sunni Arab world was from Netanyahu and his entourage when they came here, remember, a year and a half ago. And I think this was sort of around the time, remember Obama had that Camp David Correct. summit, Correct. which was really, I was there, bizarre. <laughs> um, but <laughs> in any event, I'll let that go by. But so the Israelis, Netanyahu did see an opportunity in that. And he ta even talked about it in the Oval Office. And I think everyone thought, well, you know, that's whistling past the graveyard. But you know, the enemy of my enemy may not be my friend, but I might be able to do a deal. But there has been now, since then, one, you have, I think, a level of trust or affinity between Trump and Netanyahu that you did not have between Netanyahu True. and Obama. That's one. There is also a level of trust that the Arab countries, especially Gulf countries, have in Trump they did not have in Obama mm -hmm. because of the Iran deal and because they thought that you know, he was more pro-Iran than he was pro-them. So on that, in that respect, both, both sides of that equation uh, have more trust in the Trump. Ad yeah, more confident in the Trump administration. Again, the co and, and, and also, since then, there has been serious movement in developing white papers, discussion papers by Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia mm. and the United Arab Emirates, in developing you know, papers on what confidence building measures between these Arab states and Israel could be going forward you know, on a technical level. So this is a serious ongoing effort. The problem, again, is the political will. And, 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 and this ex, you know, expectation of Israel that um, you know, the Arabs will accept less than the minimum they are asking right now. And for them, the minimum they need is some kind of serious action on settlement mm -hmm. activity. I mean, this is, this, is a, this, is a, this is a red line. And I don't know if Netanyahu, you know, with his uh, right government, flank, exactly, can about. deliver that. Yes. This is where now the red line is. But you see movements on both sides toward each other, encouraged by the American and spurred by this common, uh, common uh, perception of Iran as being an existential threat to all of them. Uh, whether this opportunity will be taken advantage of mm -hmm. or not, we'll see. Uh, yes. Yes, your mic's coming your way. I'm sorry, yes. Hi, uh, I'm Jesse Kornbluth. I work around the corner at Brookings. Um, really great film. Thanks Thank for you. that. Um, uh, Priyali, question for you. Um, so what were the biggest challenges for you um, in making this film? Um, and how did it affect you? Um, did you feel like you had a change of heart in terms of the way that you look at the conflict or the way that you look at people in general um, after having you know, been in the living rooms and backyards um, of these people who have gone through this struggle. Um, and second of all, I just wanted to add a point that from a political perspective, yes, it looks like the status quo is, it looks like that's going to continue for a long time. Um, but as a 30-year-old, Jewish New Yorker who's lived in Tel Aviv and who has Palestinian friends in New York um, and in Palestine. Um, I think my generation, um, technology has allowed us to kind of interact a lot more. Where in the past, in my parents' generation, that wasn't possible mm -hmm. at all. And I have friends who work in organizations between the two, and I work in an office where that happens every day. Um, and I think that from a personal level, there is some things to have a positive outlook about. Um, and I think your film does a really beautiful job of showing that. So back to the first question. <laughs> so um, I mean, I was, it was my first time in Israel and West Bank. Um, it's, it's true that when you read about a place, um, it's really not exactly what you find there. So when I went there, I was expecting a lot of things which were there, of course, but I did not expect this amount of disconnect. I, I did not expect, like, uh, as, as speaking to young Israelis in Tel Aviv, 
the amount of disconnect that an every a college going student or just an everyday 21 year old or 22 year old would have with something which is just two hours or three hours drive away. They didn't, I asked a few people if they had Arab friends at all and they did not know. So there was a lot of disconnect from either side and it, and I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I can blame the people for it. It's, it's because of the policies there, right? So that I wasn't prepared for, but um, that was something which we had to deal with and uh, we tried to reflect that in the film as well. Um, challenges, if you've noticed, most of our filming is indoor. Mm, yeah. <laughs> to film outdoor was a challenge. Yeah. Firstly, you take out a camera, people would be like, what are you filming? What is this about? Mm -hmm. Even the couple, they don't want to be filmed outside. They don't want, they, even while they walk outside together in Jerusalem, the, the, the husband was like, when I walk out with my child, People know that by, by looking at me that I'm Arab and, and I'm scared that my child will grow up hearing some kind of remarks. So just the challenge of filming outside, which was not possible. We had to do as much as possible indoors, yeah. So. Yes, we back there, sir. In, in 1963, I was in Jerusalem staying in a hostel run by three young Arabs exactly like the three that we meet in the opening of your film. So it took me back. <clears throat> the thing about that experience was I talked to them about, you know, what are you going to do you know, with your life? And they all said, well, nothing until the war is over. We have to wait for the war. If we survive the war, then we can think about that. <laughs> And of course, thousands of times, <clears throat> I've wondered whether they survived the 67 war. So what I was, my question is, these young men, these three young men who were, what are they thinking mm. about, about their opportunities for life? Um, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think there's a great answer to it. Um, well, I don't, I don't mean yeah. what's the answer. I mean, what do they say to you about what are they thinking as possible careers, professions, education? Do they have any, any right. notions about that? Right. So, for example, Ala, who's in the film, um, and he met Eden in the in the music group that he plays, he said he initially joined the music group to get an opportunity to travel abroad to see the world. And thanks to that, he could come to the US. Uh, but he cannot continue with his education because the family, his father is a cab driver. They can't support the, uh, him going to college. Uh, he has to drop out. He works as a waiter in a club. I don't think they have they, they're just looking for immediately meeting their needs. Mm. I don't think they're looking at a long-term plan because they, they cannot afford to. They cannot afford to financially, politically, like I said, economically. I, I don't think it's viable for them to look at a long-term plan. So it's unfortunate, but that's what I found. But there are, I mean, I have reported from, I think I told you about this on Sunday, Ramallah, you know, there are middle class 20 to 35 year olds who are doing really interesting things, you know, in, in high tech in you know, they're building. I mean, if you go to Ramallah now, you'll be stunned. I mean, it just the building that's going on and so on. And they never talk, they don't talk about two state solution, all that politics. They just right. said, let us just, you know, we've got, there's money coming in, and these are, of course, well-educated ones. And I, right. I think I mentioned to you, it's in a sort of a hip restaurant run by a, a man, Palestinian-American from Falls Church, and he decided to come over and start, you know, like a cool restaurant there. Um, so, I, you know, it, I think it does depend socioeconomically. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes, right here. Mm. 
That's, we'll get to, we'll get to almost everybody, or at least. Hi, I'm Nolan. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm interning with the Heritage Foundation. I research analysts for Middle East and Africa, but um, your film was fantastic, by the way. Thank you. Um, I had the great fortune of doing a study abroad in, um, in Jerusalem a year and a half ago at the Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies. Um, it, it, which is in East Jerusalem. And so I got a chance to meet um, pal local Palestinians, played soccer with them, and the and local Jews. And I could see the, the, the disparity and the disconnection, but I also found people that like in your film. Um, I would love to know if there's any efforts um, to uh, um, showcase your film in Israel or West Bank anywhere among um, other NGOs, schools, perhaps uh, perhaps unlikely, um, if there's any efforts there. Um, and then second question for you, Ms. Lim. Um, you're from Lebanon? Yes. Um, I'm curious, I'm, I don't know much about Lebanon, but is what are the relations between Lebanon? I know they're not great with Israel, um, but... There's no relations. None at all? No, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so... <laughs> there are no relations. <laughs> So, like I said, like during the uh, researching of the film, I was in touch with a lot of local journalists. Um, so we were talking to, uh, to a few of them, and we were talking to local uh, organizations there, and looking for opportunities and venues to screen the film. I do hope, like you do, that we will be able to screen this there. in the West Bank, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem. Uh, the idea of making a film is to for more and more people to see it. Uh, whether in the U.S. or in Israel or West Bank. Will we have access to it to share on social media? Or? Uh, the film is not uh, publicly uh, viewable, but yes, you can share the trailer and information about the film. Uh, there's a website, which is uh, sahabak.org. But have you thought about just releasing it through the internet? I mean, just releasing it that way. Uh, we want to do a little bit of the festival circuit mm. before yes. oh, we yes. release it on the of internet. Yeah. <laughs> Winning a prize would be nice. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, both these two, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name's Nick Riker and I'm visiting from the United Kingdom. Um, and I grew up in a country where bombing was a fairly common occurrence, of course, with the troubles in Northern Ireland. And who would have believed that um, within my lifetime, we would have had Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley in government as friends. So anything is possible. And, and if you were to learn lessons of other conflicts, Northern Ireland would be one. Isn't one of the things that becomes really important that the friends of uh, Israeli Jews and the friends of Palestinians re respectively pressure their friends to have the courage to compromise? But... Don't you think you know, if I can just add to your question, I was struck in the film that every, all of the characters that had pressure the other way. Could it? Right? Yes. Yes. Correct. Yes. Correct. 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 But you're yes. suggesting what? That, that, that the, the friends, diaspora. That the friends of Israel put pressure on their uh, uh, Israeli friends, if you like, to, to have the courage to compromise, and similarly, friends yes. of Palestinians. Uh, I think they try, like, I, th I think in their own way they try. For example, uh, the father, Rami, uh, or the father of the girl who was killed in the suicide bombing, he's part of a group called the Parent Circle Group. And um, he has been working very closely with other parents on the Palestinian side who lost their children. So one of his best friends actually is another father who lost his daughter about six years after Rami lost his daughter. So there are groups like this who are trying on either side, and I think Randa made mentioned that before, that there are these points of contact where people are trying. Um, more locally, like in the first scene, you see Allah trying to tell his friends, can I bring my mm -hmm. friend here? Can we all do music together? There are these small little attempts, um, but yeah. But for instance, there was for quite a while a journal called Bitter Lemons. Uh -huh. I don't know if anyone uh -huh. here knows that. Uh -huh. It knows this. Yeah, you do. Uh -huh. uh, Yossi Alfer and um, what's his name? Hassan Khatib. And, and basically, it was a journal in which both 
Israelis and Palestinians would write about all of these issues and, you know, what it would take. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, they were op-eds, they were columns, they were suggestions, they were exchanging ideas. When w I went to interview Yossi Alfer, and this might have been five years ago, but anyway, they had shut it down. And the reason they shut it down is that it had become untenable for Palestinians to write for it, you know, for intellectuals, professors, because of the social pressure from their own community. And, and it, was, it was very sad, and we, we sat in his garden with a lemon tree, and I don't know, it was just very, very, uh, very discouraging because they were both people of prominence and, and, and it had won accolades, all kinds of accolades, and the, the pressure was just too great. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, <laughs> after this gentleman, then you're next, Casey. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, my name is Kami, but I'm with the Pakistani spectator, and my question is on the basis of all three of your observation, do you see that Palestinian coming, you know, distancing themselves uh, from religi uh, religion and becoming a little more secular, or I mean if they can make relationship between God and themselves personal rather than on a societal level. And I'm asking this question because after September 11, you know, there was a great momentum in Palestine movement and in Indian occupied Kashmir movement, but after September 11, you know, India, Israel, or and in any country where you have Muslim oppressed, you can oppress Muslim, you can make them victim, and you can get away by stating, oh, they are all terrorists. So in other words, I mean, regardless if they want to bring Islamic uh, uh, laws in their Palestinian mm -hmm. state, but can they just adopt some kind of ch political charter that would keep them secular because it would be easier for them to make peace with Israel? Thanks. You want to take that? Well, I mean, the same could be said of the Israelis, you know, distancing themselves from their religion. I think it's not a, uh, it's, 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 it's unfair to ask, uh, you know, this whole narrative about Islam being associated with terrorism is, uh, is unfortunate. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's unfair to put the burden just on one side of the equation and not on the other side of the equation. There are Jewish settlers who are engaging in violent act against Palestinian. So I think both sides are using religion or groups within both sides are using religion to justify a narrative of violence and dehumanization of the other when religion is not to be used for this purpose. Uh, it's used for this purpose for political uh, reasons. So, uh, so this is the whole question about political Islam and you know relationship between the Middle East and the West and. Uh, uh, it's it's a it's a tough issue, but I, I I am I am a believer that all religions are religions of peace, and they get abused by political entrepreneurs uh, for advancing uh, causes mm -hmm. that are not um, reflective of the humanistic values that are common to all religions. You know, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism whatever there is a religion. Now this issue of secularism and being associated with peace versus Islamists not being associated with peace, I can also point to secularists who are very much, have endorsed violent as a, violence as a means to advance their causes. So it's not, uh, it's not such an easy uh, you know, claim to be made. So, uh, so uh, I don't know if I answered your question, <laughs> but that was my Reaction and also, it. don't. Uh, it just seems to me it's a completely unrealistic. I mean, it's an, it's a creative idea, but it's unrealistic. You can't ask people, as a price of living in peace, to somehow put their religion in a box. Even though we live in a very secular society, despite having a lot of religious people, it just it doesn't seem to me. But also, I think the answer is to reclaim Islam mm -hmm. from the extremist. It's not to give up Islam and to give up that space to be occupied by extremism. That's the answer, is to reclaim the, the religion, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, from you know, extremists that try to justify unjustifiable acts in the name of religion. Yes.
Casey, do you have a question? Priyali and Margaret and I occasionally hang out and talk about <laughs> politics and solve the world problems. Um, but I, I had a specific question. I've seen the film before. I'm a huge fan, a huge supporter, and Priyali and I have talked about this. The Parent Circle organization that you mentioned, I had a chance to um, go to Israel and travel to the West Bank about 10 months ago, the beginning of this year. It was my first time as well. I spent about 10 days on the ground and had a chance to meet a really great cross-section of people um, on both sides and across the political spectrum. And what sort of I left, um, the feeling that I left with was the enormous disparity between the feelings of everyday Israelis and Palestinians and the political messaging that we received in briefings with the leadership um, of all political groups. It's a huge chasm, perhaps what you would often expect in a conflict zone. But the day that resonated most with me was when I met with the, um, uh, the Parents Family Forum, which for those who don't know, is a community-based organization made up of families that have suffered a first person loss as a result of the conflict. And so I spent an afternoon with a widow, um, a Palestinian widow whose husband was shot in the back by um, forces uh, by Israeli police assuming that he had a suicide belt on. He was walking down the street with his children. That widow um, spent sort of the, that month that uh, I had a chance to meet with her with an Israeli father who lost his daughter while she was serving in the Israeli forces to a suicide bomber. They were quite literally two sides of the same coin sharing incredibly traumatic stories. They resonated with our group immensely. I had a chance to go and talk to them afterwards and ask them and the, the answer to this question is what like, has made me the most depressed, that the organization that they have set up is incredibly impactful. As many people as they can talk to in the community and beyond has the potential to try and at least shift the policy discussion. And I asked both of them, do they get any support in terms of funding from Palestinian organizations or from any organization affiliated with the Israeli government? And the answer they both solemnly said was no. The only support that they receive in an organization is the tacit approval to travel to various areas. So I found that discouraging because what they're doing is incredible work and brave, I would add, and I think is a reflection of what people on the ground living their ordinary days would like to see more of, would like to see a conversation that has real impact on policy, and I'm just curious whether or not you see anybody being able to push the needle. Other organizations, and look, I think this film has the potential to do that as well. Um, Casey, is that question for me? Because I think you pretty much said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just, you know. But yes. How do you, uh, so, how do so we... So, talking about the Parent Circle Forum, so Rami's story is pretty much exactly the same. His, his, uh, his daughter uh, was going in a mall with some other girlfriends of hers, and in a suicide bombing, she lost her life. But his best friend, who was a Palestinian, Bassam, he lost his daughter when she was just walking out of school, and an Israeli soldier fired at her. It was a rubber bullet, but it hit her, and it caused some brain injury, and she died. So they both are fighting together, against the occupation policy, but they both have suffered similar losses, grave losses of their daughters. So, yeah. There, there is also an, a, a, a movement now that is trying to emulate the Standing Rock movement in this country, mm. you know, um. and that's forming a, uh, it's, it's tr building strategic uh, non-violent non alliances between Israelis, Palestinians, but also friends of both, you know, Jewish diaspora groups. And one such example is in a village called Sarura in South Hebron, uh, where you had this alliance uh, going to this village, which is in decaying condition, which under military, Israeli military control where there is a push for the citizens to leave so that the land could be appropriated by, um, you know, by, by Israel. And they have gone now, this alliance, and created a camp in the village 
and they call it the Sumud Freedom Camp. The Sumud mm. is resistance. And what they are trying to do is, their objective is to draw attention to the plight of the village, to try to reclaim you know, the Palestinian land, but, and also to, to try to rehabilitate the village. And that's an example of, in a way, a, a radical civil disobedience um, that, that's trying to, to do that through a continuous presence you know, in these villages. And, and, and it's, it's very much similar to, you know, in this country, civil rights movement, when you had whites going into the South to work with black civil rights movement and try to push you know, the cause of, of, of civil rights. So these are attempts now that are happening that are being very much informed by the access through information technologies to experiences that are going on around the world of active civil disobedience. And, and that has potential because it brings again a new kind of alliance which has not been the case in the past as it is, in the, as, as, as it is here between you know, Israelis, Palestinians, and diaspora groups. That's a hopeful note, and since I promised to end this on time, and I've already broken my promise, I'm going to end it. I'm sorry. I know you had a question, and maybe you can catch us afterwards. But then you you filmed the film, so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, Priyali, congratulations on really yes, a beautiful film, Thank very you thought so provoking, much. and I, I hope it can get wide distribution in every way possible. Yes. Thank you. Uh,